So I guess we will begin. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight for the presentation, Cyanobacteria and Our Blue Spaces. This is a presentation on the data collected by most of you, our local community scientists in and around Worcester here in 2022. And I'm just so thrilled that you're here tonight, either as a citizen or a community scientist or here to support our community scientists. You all have worked so hard over the course of the year and really the last five years to get us to this point where we've really been able to create some solid data sets, collect a lot of high quality samples and data that are getting us to a point where we're really beginning to be able to assess the risk of cyanobacteria blooms in our lakes and ponds. And it's just really cool to be here tonight and be able to share this information with you. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to let you know if you do need to use the restrooms, if you go straight out of this door um, on the left, the first set I think is the men's room, and if, the, if you keep going past the stairwell um, on the left is the, the ladies' room, and they're all unlocked and ready for you to use if you need them. Um, additionally, um, I encourage you to at any point during the presentation if you need to um, stand up and um stretch or grab something to eat at the uh, table in the back. Tonight our catering is from Chow Bella in, on West Boylston Street in Worcester. This is our first time using them. It certainly won't be the last because they are delicious. So feel free to go up and grab anything that you need throughout the presentation. Um, this presentation is being recorded tonight for those of us who were not able to make it so they'll get a chance to see it later. Um, because of that, we're going to have some specific times throughout the presentation where we're going to open it up to questions. If you don't mind um, holding off until those breaks, um, I think I'll be able to more uh, efficiently move through the presentation if we have them in groups like that. Um, so without further ado, I, um, my name is Jacqueline Burmeister. I'm the coordinator of the Lakes and Ponds program here with the Department of Sustainability and Resilience with the City of Worcester. Um, the City of Worcester staffs the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. This is a community group um, that was kind of incubated with the city. Um, not here tonight um, is the senior environmental analyst, Nick Pagan. He is also staffs the WCMC. Unfortunately, he's not feeling well. I know he's really sad to miss all of you here. So tonight, um, we are going to be talking about a few different things. Whoops, I need to go backwards. So we're gonna do um, a brief overview of what cyanobacteria are. If you're here visiting with us for the first time tonight, maybe you're um, not as familiar with the terminology. Um, we're gonna talk about exactly what the WCMC is, what they do, um, their accomplishments in 2022, their findings in our lakes, what they actually went out there and found throughout the course of the season. And finally, what we're looking forward to in 2023. So jumping in, quick review for a lot of you. What are cyanobacteria? Cyanobacteria are also known as blue-green algae. Um, they are microscopic organisms. They are some of the oldest organisms on the planet. 3.5 billion, with a B, years old. And the reason they've made it so far is that they're incredibly efficient and they're, um, they are just very well at adapting to new scenarios. So they use sunlight for energy, a lot like algae. Um, they photosynthesize. They use those pigments chlorophyll, as well as another one called phycosynthesis that we'll talk a lot about, but they're found everywhere. We find them in glaciers, we find them in deserts, and yes, we find them in our lakes and ponds. Normally, it's not a problem. They're naturally occurring. They're actually an essential part of the ecosystem. However, lakes can bloom under certain circumstances. A bloom is when these cyanobacteria multiply out of control and take over a water body, either turning it pea soup green or creating these really nasty scums that a lot of you have seen from time to time on our water bodies. 
So unfortunately, these blooms are not just nasty to look at. They can be detrimental to the environment. They can be um, harmful to public health and, of course, not great for recreation. In fact, every year, we lo um, the tourist industry use loses millions of dollars worldwide because of cyanobacteria blooms. After cyanobacteria blooms are done being kind of gross, they all die, and as they do so, bacteria come and decompose them. In that process, they take all the oxygen out of the water, meaning that there's none left for the fish, and we can occasionally see fish kills resulting after cyanobacteria blooms. Finally, and most importantly, and one of the main reasons why a lot of you are part of the WCMC is because cyanobacteria can produce toxins that are harmful to pets and humans. So amongst the different cyanotoxins that are produced by these cyanobacteria are um, hepatotoxins, which affect the liver, and neurotoxins, which of course affect the brain. Some of the symptoms that can result in spending too much time with cyanobacteria when there's toxins in the water, um, irritation of the skin, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, not nice stuff. And in fact, we have had um, cases, not in Worcester, but there have been cases of deaths of animals like dogs after ingesting these scums. And so um, they're definitely something that we want to keep an eye out for. Um, one of the very um, disturbing things about cyanobacteria at this point is how little we really understand what triggers a bloom, what triggers them to multiply at this rapid rate, and then after that, we don't even really understand what triggers the toxins to be produced. Another thing that's disturbing is that while green scum, if we could just say like, oh, there's green scum, don't go in the water, not all blooms produce the green scum. Not all blooms make the water body turn green. These blooms can produce toxins without any of that visual evidence. And so being able to monitor a waterway is really important for public health. Unfortunately, the current testing that is approved by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is really problematic. Not only is it incredibly expensive to get these tests run, but it takes a long time to get the results. And to understand the results, you kind of need a little bit of scientific literacy. Um, because of that, the city of Worcester is really only able to manage cyanobacteria um, using these tests as guides at two of our over 20 water bodies. And so that's obviously an issue since reports of blooms are becoming more and more common across the uh, city and across the region. So enter the WCMC. The WCMC um, came about around, well, it started to come about around 2017, shortly after the Lakes and Ponds program was created, when requests for more information on cyanobacteria became more frequent as awareness increased of some of the challenges related to them. So the city worked with, e with the EPA and the University of New Hampshire to determine if there are some other methods that we could use to learn a little bit about cyanobacteria in our lakes and ponds without necessarily using those expensive tests. So we could learn something without necessarily using that test that's approved by the Commonwealth. We just wanted to know anything that we can do. So in 2017, a small group of you, some of you are still here tonight, um, probably representing three ponds, um, we went out and um, we used a plankton net and we collected a few samples um, and then we grabbed a microscope and we sat in the back of the uh, office at Regatta Point and we went through and just saw if there was anything in the, uh, in the sample, if there were any organisms that looked suspicious and we um, just took pictures of them and that was it. Did we see it? Was it there? Was it not? Were there a lot? Wasn't quantitative, we just wanted to see. Over time, people became more interested in this project they joined the, uh, the collaborative and we were able to gain more and more information and begin to expand the number of tests that we were doing, um, all the while keeping in mind that we wanted to keep it something that ordinary people from the community are able to carry out. 
So up here is a photo of our group in 2019, right before the pandemic. And then in 2021, you can see we've already grown to 2021. And by 2022, we have sampled over 28 lakes and ponds here in Worcester. So we've grown quite a bit since 2017. So what our volunteers do, they're trained in the significance of cyanobacteria, sample collection, and the identification of cyanobacteria, the different species that exist. They collect samples up to two times per month in our local water bodies of their choice. They use microscopes to identify the cyanobacteria, and then they meet other water quality advocates in their community. Um, the city partners with this group, they provide um, they coordinate sample collection and provide training location and materials. Um, we run additional tests on the samples that you bring in, and we provide twice monthly reports on the water quality results. So by 2022, our goal has evolved quite a bit thanks to all of your help. The goal in 2022 is now not just to see if there's a cell that is a cyanobacteria cell, but we're now trying to determine the toxin exposure risk of a, in a water body that we're sampling. We want to know that if we are going to go into this water body, is there a risk of us being exposed? We want to keep it simple, quick, cheap, and we want the results to be easy to interpret. And the way that we accomplish that is we wanted to be able to assign colors to the risk level. This is a method that we use a lot in the Lakes and Ponds program to really make the data easy to interpret. So if you see that your pond is in the blue, then you're good. The green, also pretty good. It's a low risk of exposure. Your risk is getting a little bit more elevated as you go into the orange category, and you're probably blooming if you're in the red category, which means that you need to start considering the possibility of toxin exposure. So we're gonna be using this uh, this color uh, graph throughout the evening, but I need to warn you that this is based on an EPA approved method. However, this is not recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is something that Worcester is working on internally to create using data that we've collected, not just from you guys, but from the Lakes and Ponds program, and we've been refining it year after year, and we feel like this year we've really come made significant strides in being able to use this to um, determine the risk of toxin exposure. So how do we get to that number? Remember, we don't have those expensive tests. We really have volunteers that are trained um, to collect samples. So what are they doing to get to that point? Our volunteers are trained to collect three types of samples out in their water bodies. The first sample they collect is the net sample. This is the one that we saw in the first picture. This is our roots, the net sample. We go out, we concentrate the water and the organisms in the water, and then we look at the water under the microscope. There's a much higher chance of us seeing organisms there, and we can kind of see the relative abundance of each type of organism in the water. So our volunteers will then take the water, put it under the microscope, look around, take photographs of what they see, take notes, and they get some really great pictures. At this point, we use this um, for quality control of our data, as well as to give us an immediate warning if there's something going on in the water body in that moment. The second type of sample that our volunteers take when they're out in the field is the IT, the integrated tube. So this is a uh, meter long tube that's put into the water vertically and it collects a cross section of the water, collecting all cyanobacteria in that cross section. So this is what it looks like. Um, these samples are then brought to the lab and, and scan on a fluorometer, which measures that photosynthetic synthetic pigment called phycocyanin. So phycocyanin is a lot like chlorophyll, which is what you remember from biology class. Phycocyanin is unique to cyanobacteria. So if you see phycocyanin coming up on this instrument, it means that your sample has cyanobacteria, and then we could measure the concentration of it. 
these graph, these uh, results, we always are thinking about relative to the number 50. 50 RFUs are relative fluorescence units, which is the unit that fluorometer um, spits back at us. Um, that's kind of where we start raising our eyebrows on if there might be a problem with um, cyanobacteria. So that's the IT sample. The grab sample um, is a very simple sample. It is just a bottle that you open up, you put it through the water, you grab the water, and that's it. It's as simple as it can be. Um, basically, what this sample is used for is to just see exactly um, what is in the water in the concentration that it exists where you're taking the sample. We take this sample and we run it through what's called a flow cam. A flow cam is a really awesome device. Um, it's basically a high throughput microscope camera. So you put in a measured amount of water and it will photograph every organism that goes by and then give you a printout of everything. Cyanobacteria, green algae, diatoms, you name it. From this, we're able to identify the different types of cyanobacteria that are present, plus the comparative diversity or the comparative density of these organisms to everything else in the sample. And so we are able to create graphs in which we're able to Oops. in which we're able to track how the uh, density of these organisms versus the rest of the non-cyanobacteria in the sample relate. So we have those three samples, we have those results. How do they come together? I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but we'll have a chance to um, talk more about it later in the presentation. So the IT sample, that integrated tube, gives us the pigment, the phycocyanin. We can color code all of the results, um, and we could say that 50 is really high and zero is really low. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as just using phycocyanin to determine how, what the risk of toxin production is because different types of cyanobacteria, they produce different amounts of phycocyanin and different amounts of pigment. Therefore, you need to have a little bit more information than just phycocyanin or the pigment to know what the risk is. That's where the, gra where the grab sample comes in. We're able to identify the species of cyanobacteria present. Um, these are the six species that are most um, observed in Worcester, Oscillatoria, Aphanomenazon, Microcystis, Dilichospermum, Microcystis debris, and Warnichinia. That's a mouthful, don't worry. <laughs> They're the ones, we have pictures up here um, just to make it easier to, uh, to track them. Um, so those different species produce different levels of phycocyanin and they produce different toxin concentrations. So the third thing that we need to determine the, the risk of exposure to toxins is the comparative density of cyanobacteria to those other organisms. And so this is one is a little bit more complicated to wrap your head around. So these are the cyanobacteria in two samples. We have a lot of cyanobacteria on the left and on the right we have a few. The relative density, however, of the sample on the left compared to all those other organisms that are not cyanobacteria is much uh, lower than on the right just because of the nature of the sample. We're looking at the density of the cyanobacteria relative to the other organisms. So that would be um, a lower comparative density and a higher competitive, uh, comparative density. And so that all comes together to give us our toxin exposure risk. What we would do after all the volunteers bring in their samples, we would run them for the tests, and within three to four days, we would have a report that looks like this that gives all the results from all of those tests and the um, estimated um, r exposure risk for each lake and pond. We would post this on the website as well as the photographs that were taken by the volunteers. And so all of that can be found on the Worcester WCMC website. So we've come a really long way from just looking at cyanobacteria under the microscope. We have developed a methodology to determine if there is a risk of exposure to toxins in our lakes and ponds. In addition, um, this year we had over 50 volunteers trained to collect samples with the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative. 50 
people. Uh, we sampled this year 24 water bodies and we sampled them 12 sampling events. So folks came out double the amount of times they came out in 2021. 2021, we just went once a month. This time we did one Saturday a month and one Monday a month, which is amazing. Additionally, of these 24 water bodies, 75% of these lakes made it to eight of those 12 sampling events, which is amazing for a volunteer commitment um, in the community like this. So I just wanna take a moment for you all to recognize how amazing that is, and I would love it if all of the volunteers could stand up for a second so that we could recognize you. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. You've done an amazing job. <laughs> In addition to just that, there were quite a few um, ponds that made it to 90, 11 out of those 12 sampling events, 11 out of 12. So Indian Lake, Stevens Pond, and Patch Ponds teams came out and made it at, to 11 out of 12. And we had four ponds that actually made 12 out of 12 sampling events. Cook's Pond, Newton Pond, Green Hill Pond, and Manchog Pond. So excellent job, guys. That was so cool. Um, and the reason why we've been able to do this is because of how big the program has grown. We have gotten to the point where there can be multiple volunteers at a single pond. No one's doing this alone and getting to all 12. We have teams of people who could cover for each other when life happens, when we have a vacation or we have a sickness. We can still go out and sample and get that data. So. Huge accomplishment, nice job. Um, when we got these samples, we took 86 microscope photos. Our volunteers took these. We ran 1,176 fluorometry samples, and we ran 196 runs on the flow cam throughout the year. And while we put it on the website, we just didn't squirrel it away there as a document. We actually wanted to make the data as accessible as possible to the people who are using the water bodies. So this year we had signs created that talk about what the WCMC is and we were distributing them to our volunteers to put up at their sampling location so that anyone visiting that lake could come scan the QR code and be linked directly to those reports and could see the most recent data on exposure risk at that water body. But we didn't just stop at science, we crossed into art this year. <laughs> we were invited to display our photos at the JMAC um, at a, in downtown Worcester, which is a community art center for um, an environmental um, exhibit that was going on in September. So all of the photos here, and they're actually displayed on the wall back there tonight, all of these photos were taken by the volunteers in this program um, and and they got a lot of traffic that day and started a lot of conversation. In addition to just the photos, um, we also have a volunteer who has been inspired by her work with the WCMC to paint microorganisms on hollowed eggs. So these cyano eggs have different organisms on them that she found under the microscope and they also got to be displayed at this event, um, which was really neat being able to hold them and um, I think she described it as the fragility of the microorganisms comparing that to the fragility of the hollowed eggs. So I thought that was really cool um, and that the science is inspiring art. Um, so the WCMC is also uh, is, is a volunteer-driven organization, um, but we are trying really hard to create partnerships in the community, and this year I think we did a really great job at that by partnering with um, a lot of students in high school and college. So in particular, um, we partnered with an after-school program at the Ecotarium. Those students I, um, were collecting the samples at Lower Ecotarium Pond. Um, we had a, students at Bancroft School that studied Indian Lake at Shore Park. We had some WPI students that sampled Green Hill Park Pond as part of their IQP project. 
And we had students at QCC that used their findings of the WCMC for their final project at Lake Singletary. So a lot of great partnerships. So before I get into the results and, and what we have found, I wanted to take a moment to see if any of you had any questions up to this point on what the WCMC is, what, you, what we do up to this point or um, in the community. No, no questions at all? So the methods for collecting the samples, um, EPA um, helped develop, but the whole, um, you, the way that we use the data and the flow cam and other elements as part of our program um, has not, is not part of what EPA does. So we've kind of taken what EPA does and run with it. Um, and so, one thing that we'll continue to talk about is that this model is continuously being developed and there's still quite a ways that we need to go for it to be perfect, but it is a, a starting point and this is as, how far we've come at this point. Yep. So the program is funded through the city of Worcester at this point, but it's an incredibly low cost program besides staff time. The one major purchase um, that was required for um, a lot of the data that we have here that a lot of other community scientists don't have access to was the flow cam. So that was provided to us by the city of Worcester um, water operations division. Any other questions? So up to this point, we um, were creating reports every two weeks. We were putting them up on our website, and those reports were telling us the instantaneous, in the moment, based on that sampling, what the risk of cyanotoxin exposure was. We really were giving people the option of looking at those reports as they were getting ready to make choices about what water bodies they wanted to use. What we wanted to do tonight was take an opportunity to back up a little bit and look at the trends that have come about over the course of the season and try to make some um, make some statements about cyanobacteria across watersheds um, and across ponds that are similar to each other and see what we've learned about cyanobacteria um, as, as um, here in Worcester over the course of the summer. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna talk quickly and briefly about what we found at each pond. Um, for each pond, what we are going to talk about the visual inspection of clarity that each volunteer witnessed while they were there. We're gonna talk about the pigment concentrations from the fluorometry analysis, always compared to that 50 line. We're going to talk about the comparative density of cyanobacteria observed through the flow cam, so how dominant was cyanobacteria in that sample. We'll talk about the different types of cyanobacteria we found in each sample and those implications. And then I'll show you all together all of the different risk exposure scores that each water body um, had throughout the season. And so for each of these graphs, we start in May and we end in October. So on top, you could see how the risk of exposure changed in the pond throughout the season. This is the exposure risk bar, or for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna call it the ER bar. And then we'll talk about how these results compare to 2021 in the cases where we are able to do that. So as I mentioned, um, we are volunteers and so there, not all the data is 12 uh, samples. Um, in the places where we don't have data, we will have um, a gray space in the ER bar, there will be a gap in the pigment graph, or it will say NA on the com um, comparative density chart. So those just mean that we don't have data for those days. So in 
2022, we had 24 program lakes. Most of them were inside the city of Worcester. And as we start to analyze them to make the most sense of it, it makes sense to group them um, either by geography or the characteristics that they share. So in Worcester, we have quite a few watersheds. Um, we have the Tatnick Brook watershed, the Lake Quinsigamon watershed, and the Mill Brook watershed. Um, so those water bodies are hydrologically connected to each other, and so it makes sense that there would be some similarities between them and that we study them as a group. Additionally, we had a bunch of urban park ponds that were sampled, so these ponds are not necessarily connected to these larger watersheds because they're man-made, they're shallow, or they're mostly connected to the stormwater system. And finally, we had quite a few volunteers in our program come in from really far away from Worcester. Um, we, have, we had folks come in from Sterling, Sherborne, Shrewsbury, Millbury, Sutton, and Auburn to bring their samples. And all of these areas are less um, urban than Worcester, and so we are going to call them rural ponds and compare them with each other. So we're going to jump right in with the Tatnick Brook Watershed. The Tatnick Brook Watershed has four ponds that were sampled by our volunteers. And the characteristics of this watershed are that um, Tatnick Brook flows from north to south, and there's a pure... Uh, uh, a series of impoundments along the way that cause these, these um, water bodies to form. And it has been known to host cyanobacteria in the lower regions. So we'll talk first about Cook's Pond. So Cook's Pond is at the top of the watershed in Worcester, and the volunteers reported the water to be generally clear all season. Um, when we look at the pigment numbers, we see that they didn't get very high. Um, there was no pigment re read at all. It wasn't even detected in May and June, and it really only got as high as 13, so nowhere near that 50 bar. When we look at the comparative density of the cyanobacteria to the other stuff in the sample, we see there's no cyanobacteria in the beginning of the season and a very low amount compared to the other organisms as you go through. And if we look at the speciation of those cyanobacteria, it's dominated by Dilichospermum and Ephanomenazon. We'll talk more about what that means later. So if we look at the ER bar for Cook's Pond, we see that in the beginning of the season, it's blue, there's few cyanobacteria, there's a low pigment score, and it goes into the green, but never beyond that. So we had a very low risk of cyanobacteria toxin exposure here at Cook's Pond. These results are really similar to what we've seen at Cook's Pond in the past, and especially in 2021. And so I want to take this time to thank our volunteers, Elsie, Dan, and Patty, who are our volunteers taking these samples every single sampling session this year. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of how we're going to move through the different water bodies. So we're going to go next to Patch Reservoir, which is the next impoundment on Tatnick Brook. So after June, um, Patch Reservoir was reported as turbid um, throughout the, the rest of the season. We see that there is a jump in the pigment up to 353, which is way above that 50 bar, and that happens in July. Um, we see that July, we also have a very high concentration of cyanobacteria compared to other, cyan or other organisms in the water, and that we have the same cyanobacteria here that we saw in Cook's Pond, just much more of them. And so we see in the ER bar that while we were okay in the beginning of the season, we were in the blue, we quickly go into the red, and then we kind of have two periods of blooms here in Patch Reservoir throughout the season. And this um, pigment level was elevated compared to 2021. So thanks to our volunteers Donna and Peg for grabbing these samples for us. The next impoundment is a very small lake called Patch Pond that is in between Patch Reservoir and Coase Reservoir. It's a lot shallower. Um, the water was reported as turbid all season with occasional scums on it. The max pigment here was 66, so slightly above, um, pretty far above, um, excuse me, above the 50 mark, but it happens much later in the season. It's at the end of October that we're seeing these numbers. 
So that's interesting. It's not the same time as the patch reservoir. We see that there is a high um, density of cyanobacteria in the beginning of the month, and there's a lower at the end, and yet um, maybe they're dominating, um, maybe there's just more of them um, compared to the other um, organisms. So um, the micros microcystis is a cyanobacterium that we are seeing for the first time in the watershed. We didn't see that in the other two lakes. And so here in Patch Pond, we were never really in the blue. We had one month we were in the blue, but we saw a lot more orange and red throughout the season. And this was, um, this is the first time that we're studying Patch Pond. And so this data is gonna be used as a baseline for future um, studies. So thanks to Alyssa and Emily for taking these samples for uh, Patch Pond. And then we had Coe's Reservoir, which is the last uh, lake in the Tatnick Brook watershed. And Coe's Reservoir is a recreational space. It has a public beach. And this year was a really tough year for Coe's Reservoir. Um, scums were seen at the lake edges multiple times during the season. The pigment was above 50 in end June or end July and early October. We had to close Coe's Reservoir two times this year. That's the first time it's ever happened, even once. So we saw elevated cyanobacteria density all season long. Um, and we saw even more diversity of cyanobacteria. We had all the things that we saw in Patch Pond, but we also had Warrenichinia, so a fourth species of cyanobacteria here in Coes Reservoir. We saw that we had three months where we were in the red and there was possible toxin exposure according to this model. Um, these pigments were elevated over 2021. Like I said, this was not a great year for Coe's Reservoir. Thank you, Pat, for uh, going out and grabbing these samples for us. We really needed someone to look after it. <laughs> so the conclusion for Tatnick Brook, generally we have higher pigment um, and more diverse cyanobacteria as you descend through the watershed, but the blooms aren't necessarily occurring at the same time, which is an interesting conclusion. They're not necessarily causing each other or related. Um, if we look at the observations that we saw of different cyanobacteria species, delichospermum was the most abundantly seen in our samples. So we're gonna head to the other side of the city now and talk about the Lake Quinsigamon watershed. There were five ponds in the Lake Quinsigamon watershed um, that were sampled, and the characteristics of this watershed um, that are interesting are that it includes three municipalities, which ch presents challenges for management, of course, but it didn't stop our volunteers from going out there and grabbing these samples. Um, in general, water flows from the outside out down to Lake Quinsigamon, flows through Lake Quinsigamon to Flint Pond, and then down to the Quinsigamon River. And we have been known to see, it has been seen that there have been cyanobacteria in Lake Quinsigamon in, um, in the fall. So Newton Pond is the northernmost portion of the Lake Quinsigamon watershed in this sample. Um, but the clarity was slightly turbid to opaque throughout the season. We saw, or our volunteers saw, some green slimes on the top of the water. However, when we looked at the pigments, they were all very low. They were non-detected for most of the season, and they went up to 13 just just once in the end of September. So these green scums were probably something like a green algae, something that's not necessarily quite so harmful. Uh, we saw very uh, low cyanobacteria um, next to none most of the time. Um, and we saw delicious bermum and Warrenichinia, as well as a phanomenazon when we did see them. But if you look at the ER bar, mostly green and blue for Newton Ponds. So it had a really good year. Um, this diversity reflected what we saw in um, 2021 as well, although that little spike happened a little bit earlier, um, happened in August, but um, very, very good year for Newton Pond. Um, so thanks to Linda, Bob, and Phil for heading out there and grabbing those samples. Jordan Pond is located in Shrewsbury. It also feeds into Lake Quinsigamon. The clarity rated from clear to slightly turbid. There were some green scums observed at times there. Um, the pigments peaked at 22 RFUs. For such a small, shallow pond, you would think maybe they would be a little bit higher, but they are actually quite a bit below that 50 mark. 
Um, the cyanobacteria were not really detected any time except for a little bit in August or at the end of July. And um, we just saw some AFAN and some oscillatoria. So it was mostly blue and green, except for that one day when we had elevated pigment and those two types of cyanobacteria. So this was a, a new pond for 2022, so this will be a baseline um, for, future, for future data um, that's collected here. So Barbara, thank you so much for being our volunteer for uh, Jordan Pond. So Bell Pond is not necessarily hydrologically connected to Lake Quinsigamon, it's just in the same region. In fact, Bell Pond is fed mostly by underground springs, which is probably why it was observed to be clear almost all year long. <laughs> The pigment concentrations were undetected for the entire season, so it, it was doing pretty well. Cyanobacteria was detected in low density at the end of September, but for the rest of the season, we didn't even see anything in the sample. Um, and so we saw some delicious sperm and microcystis um, debris toward the end, but very low numbers in Bell Pond, pretty much blue for the entire season. Um, so the results were similar to what we saw in 2021 with even lower pigment concentrations. So thanks to Kathy, who has taken on Bell Pond yet again this year. Lake Quinsigamon. So Lake Quinsigamon is a very large, deep lake. So it has very different dynamics than a lot of these shallower ponds that we've been looking at. Um, the pigments were low for most of the beginning of the season, but then began to creep up toward that 50 mark that we never recorded anything above 50. We did start to see some scums at the end of the season, however. Um, we did see cyanobacteria in almost every sample that we took with increasing abundance toward the end of the season. And um, it seemed like there was an increasing diversity of the cyanobacteria throughout the season as well. Um, so while the beginning of the season, which is kind of when we're recreating in Lake Quinsigamon, again, a huge recreational space, it was in the blue and the green. So we're, we're feeling pretty good. Um, as you got toward the end of the season and even beyond in October, we did see um, and hear that Lake Quinsigamon continued to become a little bit more opaque and scummy. So this is an, the interesting difference from Lake Quinsigamon from 2021 is that in 2021 we started at a really high concentration in the beginning of the summer and by the end of um, October it was down to zero. So a really weird switch of events for Lake Quinsigamon. Thanks to Steve and Sarah for collecting these samples. Flint Pond is what Lake Quinsigamon um, empties into to the south. It's a lot, a lot shallower than Lake Quinsigamon, but is very much the same water from Lake Quinsigamon. Um, there's a higher turbidity throughout the season. There were green scums toward the end of the season. Um, the pigment was fairly low until the end of the season when I think it got to over 90 RFUs. And so we saw a lot of this at Flint Pond by the end of the season. Um, so the cyanobacteria was always there, just not at a very high relative density um, compared to the other things in the water, but apparently it got high enough by the end. We had a really big diversity of organisms here too, a lot of microcystis. And so we'll see that in the beginning of the season, we were kind of in the green, and as things went on, we, we kind of entered that red zone for Flint Pond. And so this is kind of supporting some of the data we had from 2021 as well, that um, toward the end of the season, like Lake Quinsigamond, we do see more scums and, and perhaps um, some more blooms. So thanks to Peter for grabbing these samples. So in general with Lake Quinsigamond, the smaller tributary lakes like Newton Pond and Jordan Pond, they aren't necessarily creating environments for cyanobacteria. They're actually doing pretty well. However, Lake Quinsigamon, when you get into the fall months and, and Flint Pond as well, we're starting to see more cyanobacteria activity. Um, unlike Tatnik Brook watershed, where delicious spermum was the um, main organism that we saw here, it was um, a phanomenazon. So different uh, dominance of cyanobacteria in the same city. 
We're going to the middle of Worcester, the Millbrook watershed. This is a very small slice of that. It's dominated by Indian Lake. Um, the other two water bodies that were tested as part of this watershed were Kiver Pond and Little Indian Lake. Um, so this watershed, obviously Indian Lake is kind of like, is, is a huge uh, recreational resource to the city. It's also the birthplace of cyanobacteria of research in Worcester. Um, it's connected to Salisbury Pond through a culvert that goes underground. Um, well, it's culverted to uh, Salisbury Pond a little bit later. And so it, it, it is known to have challenges with cyanobacteria. Kiver Pond is a small pond that's privately owned to the west of Lake Quinsigamon, and it is turbid or opaque all season long until late September. We saw pigment concentrations jump to 104, 158 at various times, but they'll also drop back down to like 17, so we had like a very jumpy graph here. Um, despite the fact that we had these really high pigment numbers, we saw no cyanobacteria under the microscope. So what's going on there? We know there's cyanobacteria, we don't see them. What we're starting to learn more about as a scientific community is an organism called picocyanobacteria. So if you have macroscopic things and you have microscopic things, pico means that it's like super small. And it, we aren't really able to even detect it on our flow cam or in our microscopes. And so it is possible. Um, we know that picocyanobacteria is capable of producing some toxins. And so because of that, if we don't see it there, we assume it's there and we need to give the red score. So we had a lot of, um, a lot of high risk sampling days at Kiver Pond. Um, and this is very similar to the observations we had in 2021 as well. So we have a power team in this watershed um, of Dana, Karen, and Preston. They actually sample every lake in the watershed. <laughs> they go to Indian Lake after they visit Kiver. Um, the water here is opaque or turbid. Um, all season long. <laughs> um, the pigments here were even higher than at Kiver Pond. They went up to, well, it was 140, 132, but they stayed high above that 50 line for most of the season. So um, that we also saw elevated cyanobacteria density throughout the whole season um, with a diverse array of organisms, including microcystis, um, which is a huge toxin producer. So we look at the bar for Little Indian Lake, it's even more staggering than Kiver Pond. We are in the red really early for, Indian Lake, for Little Indian Lake. So we kind of all want to hold our breath when it comes to Indian Lake because it has been known to have problems in the past. So yes, thanks to Dana, uh, Karen, and Preston again for that. So water quality um, is general uh, at Indian Lake. We usually have a risk of a bloom almost every single summer. We are watching it very closely. We're treating it. We're making sure nothing happens. This year was one of the best years I've seen at Indian Lake. The water was generally reported as clear, the site slightly turbid all summer long. Um, the pigments never got above what was it, like 29? And they were usually less than 20. We did have like one day in June where we had a high abundance of cyanobacteria, but not really, uh, it, not as high as you'd expect at Indian Lake given those, tr those other um, lakes in the watershed. And so while there were some days when we got into that orange, we never had a bloom at Indian Lake. Um, and we were able to remain open all season, which is really great for that lake since it's such a big recreational resource. So all of this is pretty consistent with what we see there in other years. It's just not as intense. Uh, we were able to avoid those blooms. So thanks again to Dana, Karen, and Preston. Um, there were a few days that they weren't there. Um, they had other obligations, but we had some folks um, from Bancroft School step in and collect some um, samples during the days that um, they weren't able to get there. So that was great, an example of um, you know, the fact that we've grown so big that we're able to double up on those uh, ponds. So Millbrook watershed conclusion, summer blooms did occur in Kiver Pond and Little Indian Lake, but not in Indian Lake, thank goodness. And 
unlike the other two watersheds, the dominant cyanobacteria here was microcystis. So that's really interesting. All three watersheds have different dominant species. So next we have a bunch of small ponds throughout Worcester um, that we call park ponds. So these ponds are small and shallow and often ornamental. They're man-made most of the time. They're not really part of the landscape. Um, they're located in high recreation areas. Usually they're located in parks, which means that there's a lot of access, um, which means that if there is a risk there, there's a lot of people being exposed to that risk. So being able to assess that is important and making people aware um, Salisbury Pond was the first one um, that we're going to talk about. The water here was generally reported as turbid. No scums were observed throughout the season. The pigment um, did jump above 52 at one point early in the season, um, but stayed below it for the rest of it. Um, the cyano, no, um, cyanobacteria were only um, detected until July, so it was front-loaded here at Salisbury Pond. Um, and we really just saw a little bit of um, decaying microcystis there. And so while we had some warnings in the beginning of the season, some red days, um, it stayed in the green and the orange and ultimately got um, the cold weather did it well and it went back into the blue category for the last day that it was sampled. So this is consistent with what we've seen in 2021 as well. So thanks to Aaron and Jen Yeo for um, taking those samples at Salisbury Pond. Um, Burncoat Pond is um, a kind of an infamous pond with the WCMC. Um, the water is generally turbid with scums visible um, at times. The pigment was over 50 in every sampling session after June. Um, we have our record holder for pigment concentrations at Burncoat with uh, 1,235 RFUs. So this is one of our most productive ponds in the city. So cyanobacteria were observed in increasing density throughout the season and were really diverse, included those microcystis, delichospermum, as well as a phanomenazon. Um, and they got more diverse as the season went on, which seems to be a pattern in a lot of our lakes. So we see another example of a lake that starts in the orange and then goes to red and just doesn't come back. So this is pretty consistent with what we've seen at Burncoat Pond over the few years that it's been tested. So thank you to Meredith and Fortis for uh, picking up, well, Meredith's been working at Burnco Pond for a few years now, um, and they've been doing an excellent job um, and, and taking this one on. <laughs> so Elm Park Pond is next. So Elm Park is located in, um, well, Elm Park Pond is located in Elm Park, um, right off of Park Ave. Um, it's very shallow and um, has become very sedimented over the course of the last few years. The water is often opaque or was reported to be turbid to opaque and had a strong smell most of the season. Uh, the pigment was between 150 and 900 RFUs all season long. So this is really concerning because this is a very centralized area. Um, the cyanobacteria were elevated in almost every sampling event, and we saw all sorts of different things here, including aphenomenazon, we saw delichosperma, we saw microcystis. Um, we were in the red for the entire season at Elm Park Pond. And you could kind of imagine why that is. It's just so shallow and so warm. Um, so these, this is the first time we've done Elm Park Pond. We're looking to do some improvements there next year, so it would be really great to continue to sample here and see if those improvements make any difference in the health of the pond. So thank you again to Aaron and Jenya for, uh, for grabbing these samples. So next we have Green Hill Park Pond, which is quite a bit bigger than Elm Park Pond. Um, the water was clear to slightly turbid back to clear throughout the season, so it seemed to have some turbidity that increased during the event, during the course of the season. We had, you know, some jumps in the pigment concentration, but honestly, it stayed below the 50 mark all year long. I think it peaked at 33 RFUs. 
Um, and there were cyanobacteria always observed, but um, the lowest density, in, which is really interesting, was um, in the, the late summer months. So this is when the water would be the warmest, and we had the lowest comparative uh, density of cyanobacteria. We had a, a smorgasbord of different uh, organisms, and this is, I think, the first um, time that we're seeing oscillatoria um, dominating the cyanobacteria in July. So that's an interesting finding as well. Um, despite all these cyanobacteria, um, we really stayed in the green for pretty much half the season at Green Hill Park. Um, we did get a little bit into the orange zone, but never into the red zone at Green Hill. And this is pretty consistent with what we've seen in 2021. So thank you to Brian, Gabriel, and Michael for grabbing these samples um, all season long. Lower Ecotarium Pond is not located in a park. Um, it's located on the private property of the Ecotarium. Um, however, and so it's, it's not necessarily at, has as much access as the other ponds, but because it's so small and shallow, I thought that this would be a good grouping for it. Um, so this was sampled by um, the after school program at the Ecotarium plus the Ecotarium staff. Um, it was a little turbid in the, lakes in the uh, late spring, but um, clear with only one slightly turbid day the rest of the season. Um, pigment did go above the 50 mark um, in August, um, but was generally below 50 RFUs, which was surprising based on how shallow this pond was. Um, we didn't see much as far as cyanobacteria. So this is another pond where we're suspecting that picocyanobacteria is playing a role. Um, on the day we saw it, we saw a phantom menazon, but that was it. Um, so we kind of assumed it was picocyanobacteria. And um, at Lower Ecotarium Pond, we, we had kind of like a mix of different uh, risks throughout the season. So we went, um, it, it was really truly amazing to see how the risk could go from blue to red to blue to red um, just within two weeks. So it's, it's crazy how quickly conditions can change in a little pond for cyanobacteria. And so this is the first time we've had Lower Ecotarium Pond, and we're uh, really excited to continue to work with Ecotarium and, and collect data there. So thanks to our volunteers, Jake, Susan, and the uh, Ecotarium team. And then finally, our last uh, park pond is Leesville Pond, which is a little bit bigger than the other park ponds um, in Worcester. Um, it's got, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't have as much access. It abuts Hope Cemetery and it has some residential um, property around it. So it's a little bit different in that way than a lot of the other park ponds, but I believe it's considered a park pond technically. Um, the water was reported to be clear um, in all but the late August sampling event when it was a little bit turbid. Uh, we really didn't see any pigment detected except for one event in late August. It went up to 12. Um, so there was no cyanobacteria observed until mid-October when we saw a little bit of ephenomenazon. And so it was pretty much blue all season until the very end we had a green day for risk. And so this was a huge surprising result for us. This is the first time that we sampled at Leesville Pond. Honestly, we all thought that it was going to do a lot worse just based on how shallow it was, its location. So um, it was really cool to get those results back. Um, so this is gonna be a baseline for future research. And, and thank you so much to, for Diane and Michael for going all the way out there. They don't even live anywhere close to this pond that they went out there and, and sampled it. So, um, park ponds, what can we say about park ponds? Four of six of the park ponds had pigments over uh, 50 RFUs uh, multiple times, multiple times. So, smaller, shallow ponds have higher risk. Uh, I don't know if that's a revolutionary finding, but these smaller, shallow ponds are having very high levels of phycocyanin um, and pigment. Um, throughout the season. And here we saw a lot of microcystis debris or like decaying microcystis in the sample. And um, we think that there's some picocyanobacteria activity happening at Lower Ecotarium Pond as well as Elm Park Pond. So most of these ponds are in or abutting Worcester, but we have had some super volunteers that have come in and brought samples in from towns 
outside of Worcester, actually quite a bit outside of Worcester, including Sherborne, Sterling, Sutton, uh, Millbury, and Auburn. And just looking at this map, if this is Worcester in the middle, you see a lot of gray. That's all like pavement and sidewalk. All of these lakes out here, a lot more green. That's all that natural filtration that occurs when rain hits the ground versus hitting the gutter, right? So there is um, this expectation that um, there will be a, a less of a risk, but we can't necessarily assume that. All of these ponds are located outside of Worcester. They're larger and they're deeper than our park ponds. And um, again, gradually, a more, uh, generally a more rural landscape. So Farm Pond out in Sherborne. Um, this was clear um, till the um, end of August when it became really turbid and opaque, which was different than what we saw in the previous year when it was fairly clear for most of the season, although it did have some histories of blooms in the past. Um, we looked at pigment and it started really low and then it started creeping up in August to about 30 RFUs. Uh, despite how um, the reports of how green and turbid it was getting, we never actually saw the pigment pigment go very high. Um, so we had low to moderate cyanobacteria density th throughout the season. And the cyanobacteria community was dominated by delichospermum. And so because they actually did have what appeared to be a bloom, this information is kind of helping us deduce that not all of these blooms are cyanobacteria blooms. You could have a bloom that's disruptive to recreation and to um, the environment that's not necessarily causing toxins. So um, that was a really interesting finding here at Farm Pond. And you could see on the ER bar, we were in the green and the blue in the beginning of the season, and then we started seeing um, a little bit of an increase, but um, the, the risk of exposure to cyanobacteria never really got into that red zone despite how, um, how um, green the lake was turning. So this, this pigment data does align with what we saw in 2021, although the clarity suggested that a non-cyanobacteria bloom occurred this year versus in 2021. So this is a super team. I mean, they're, bringing, they're coming from really far away. <laughs> so we have a bunch. We have Tom, Taylor, Karen, Penelope, Jackie, Peggy, Dale, Catherine, and Zenya. Thanks. Like, that's awesome. And, and that's the way to do it if you have to come that far, right? Uh, divide and conquer. Um, East Lake Washakum is located in Sterling. So that's north of us. It's north of Quabbin. Um, so it's generally very clear. Um, it's occasionally turbid throughout the season. Um, there were no pigments detected until late September, but it really didn't go any higher than 11 RFUs. And the cyanobacteria were not really observed until the fall either, but never really got too high. Um, we did see increasing diversity throughout the season, though we started with some delicious spermum, and then we ended with some warnichnia, afan, and uh, microcystis. But for the most part, East Waste Lake Washakum stayed in the green and the blue all season long, um, and this is the first time it's in the program, so thanks so much to Sue and Serena for bringing in these samples every week, or every two weeks. Manchog Pond um, is located in Sutton. Um, the water was reported to be clear all season long. Oops. Um, pigment, when it was detected, it was less than 15 RFUs. Um, cyanobacteria was observed in low to medium densities until October, but then it disappears in the fall. Um, cyanobacteria dominance shifts between delicious spermum and Um So we actually went from more diverse to less diverse over time. Um, and we pretty much stayed solidly in the green until we got into the blue for Manchog Pond. So it got better throughout the season in terms of risk. And um, the taxa and the pigments that we see here are consistent with our 2021 data. So thanks to Phyllis and Rose for bringing in these samples. Stevens Pond is actually, I believe it's just east of um, Manchog. I think they are connected hydrologically. It's a little bit smaller. The water was clear all season except for one day when it was a little opaque. And just after that, we saw the RFUs, the um, pigment, jump up to 40 and then come right back down. So that was really interesting surprise considering that all these rural ponds never really got above 50. 
Um, this, we only saw some cyanobacteria in low densities at the end of the season, a little bit of everything there. But for the most part, Stevens Pond was solidly in the blue the beginning of the season and in the fall there was that one day where it went up into the orange, but it stayed, uh, but it came back down after that. Um, so this is the first time we've had Stevens Pond, and I'd like to thank Eric for uh, bringing in those samples um, and, and uh, bringing it into the program. Singletary Lake, located a little bit closer to Worcester here, just over in Millbury. Um, water was generally reported as clear throughout the season. Pigment was generally loaded undetected. Um, we have data for the first half of the summer, and it looks like Singletary Lake is doing really well during that time. We did see, this is one of the few lakes where we only had one, um, one um, taxa, a taxon um, or species of cyanobacteria that was identified. So we were in the blue and the green in Singletary Lake. And so thank you to Haley and Danielle for, for picking up Singletary Lake this year. And finally, we have our last pond, Dark Brook Reservoir, which is located in Auburn. Um, the water here was reported as being clear on all of the sampling days. The pigment was undetectable in every single sampling event all season long. We had a little bit of cyanobacteria, it didn't amount to not much. Um, what we um, did see was a little bit of microcystis, a little delicious spermum, um, but we stayed in the blue and the green most of the season. And this is the first time we've had Dark Brook Reservoir. And so thank you, Michelle, for, for bringing in those samples. So in general, rural ponds, very low pigment concentration throughout the season. We only had one fairly high pigment, 40 for one day at one pond. On average, we had lower cyanobacteria concentrations in the rural ponds than the other program lakes, and delichospermum is the most common um, cyanobacterium that we observed. So, <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> I get it. Um, and I know that all of you are here, many of you are here because you're interested in very particular lakes and you want to really look at that data a little bit more closely. All of the monthly reports are going to be available on the City of Worcester website and this um, PowerPoint will also be made available on that page. So you will be able to go back and sit with those graphs and wrap your head around them a little bit more in the future. Um, also, like last year, we are hoping to create hard copies of, um, of these results so that the volunteers who participate in the program can you know, flip through them as they're doing research in the future. Um, so that was pretty much looking at each pond individually. And so I wanted to, um, before I, I have a few takeaways about you know, cyanobacteria across all lakes, it's really quick, I promise, but some really interesting results when you look at everything together. Before I do that, do we have any specific questions about what we saw up to this point? Anything that stands out or was confusing um, or that needs further explanation? Does anyone have any questions? Yes, Brian. Can we get some guidance in the future as to what is turbid, what is opaque, what is clear? That's, that's a really fair point. Maybe we could um, set up some kind of um, example for, for people to reference when they're, when they're making those observations. Yeah, especially when you have multiple volunteers, your baseline isn't necessarily the same. So, yeah, we can do that. Yes? How does the data overline with the, um, the temperature and the um, Oh my goodness, yes. There's so much that we could analyze about all of this data and we could hire a full-time person to do that. I unfortunately was not able to dig into all of that at this time. However, if you are interested in that, we can provide it to you and I would love for you to give me a report on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and so that is like one of the terrible but wonderful problems that we have at this point is that, um, you know, Nick and I are staffing the WCMC, but this isn't necessarily our full-time job. What we would really love is to have a full-time person that just works on this and could do this all the time. 
<laughs> so, yeah, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are various factors. Um, one of the ones that we could trust in the most um, is the cool weather. Usually cool weather is what brings down a lot of the populations, but you saw in a lot of these examples that we'd have these spikes throughout the season, and so there is some thought that maybe it is burning itself out. A lot of the diversity that you see in these cyanobacteria populations, um, there's a lot of theories out there right now, and why we care about it is um, there are theories about how these cyanobacteria interact with each other. They're competing for the same resources, and there are theories about the use of toxins to actually dominate the space against each other. And so while we don't really understand all of it yet, we're taking this data and we're looking for patterns so that when we do understand more when the scientists over at like WPI and at UNH understand these toxin dynamics a little bit better, we could apply that knowledge here. Yes? Is there any, any um, comparison between the, the, how the water is in the pond, but those that are spring fed versus those that are, are for yeah, so in the um, in the city of Worcester, most of our lakes and ponds are um, part of, um, do have outfalls from the um, stormwater system with the exception of Bell Pond. Bell Pond is one of the only lakes in Worcester that is completely fed by groundwater, and there's a really stark difference there. Um, Apart from that, like that's one of the reasons why the, the lake data, the rural pond data is so interesting to us. Um, I am not as familiar with the hydrology of those areas um, yet, but those would be the types of questions where we would compare those lakes to each other to see um, you know, what, what, can we, what can we learn about what's going on here um, versus in, in the city where there's a lot more stormwater influence. Any other questions? Yes. How did the towns decide after they have different criteria when to advise people not to recreate? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the state has some guidance that relies on those tests that are expensive and take a lot of time, right? There are toxin tests. You could directly um, test for certain types of toxins, but there are only guidelines for certain toxins. Um, there's also, um, you could do what's called a cell count, where you have someone actually count each individual cell, and the assumption is if you have a certain number of cells, there's a high chance of toxin production. Um, so if you do that, kind of test, it's pretty cut and dry, but a lot of cities and towns are not doing those tests just because they need to have someone to take the test. They need to have someone to send it to the lab, someone to interpret it, and then some protocol for closing the lake afterwards. Even here in Worcester, we do it at two lakes. So it's, it's pretty intensive. The third thing that they can do besides the toxin test and the cyanobacteria cell count is um, if you see scums on the water, you could assume that there's cyanobacteria. And so it's really, um, during the summer months, um, what we do here in Worcester is if we see that in a swimming area, then we'll make that call. If it's no longer swimming season, then it's a little bit more open. So that, that's kind of where we're at right now, just because we're still really grappling with some of these blooms are really transient. The scum will be there today and it'll be gone tomorrow and you don't really know what the effect is until you start testing for toxins. And so, yeah, hopefully we're gonna get to a point where we could depend on these methods a little bit more because they're a lot faster and a lot cheaper. Any other questions? So I just want to show you a couple of really cool things that happen when we looked at all these colors together because I couldn't help as I was making all these bars seeing them all next to each other and I wanted to see what happened if we stack them all on top of each other. So here we have all of our watersheds. Uh, Tatnick Brook, Lake Quinsig, Millbrook, Park Ponds, Rural Ponds. What happens when we look at risk in color across all of them across the year? So this is risk. What's the first thing that pops out? 
and not altogether surprising is the summer months. We have a lot of orange and red in the summer months, but that's kind of when we expect it to happen, right? Maybe less um, expected is that we have a lot of blooms in the fall as well. Um, we see here in Worcester that it is the Millbrook watershed and the park ponds that are the most susceptible to cyanobacteria risk or exposure risk. And the rural ponds have a lot lower chance of that risk. In Worcester, it looks like the Lake Quinsigamon watershed does well throughout most of the summer and the risk really only starts revving up in the fall. Um, additionally, there were three lakes that seemed to be blooming all season long. Those included Little Indian Lake, Burnco Pond, and Elm Park Pond. And so um, for purposes of the next slide, I'm going to call these the constant bloomers. And so these are the pigments. Um, so this is kind of the same graph, but looking at the pigments and not necessarily the overall risk. So the pigments, the phycocyanin, um, Every lake is a little dot here for every date. And then so you see the 50 line, most of them are below 50, but we also have those constant bloomers that are kind of above 50. Um, we take the average and we see that phycocyanin is pretty much the highest, and phycocyanin is definitely, the pigment is the driver of a lot of these blooms. We see that it's the highest during the summer months, but we also see that it's there in the fall months as well. <laughs> But is this just all being driven by those constant bloomers? Let's take them out and average again. This is not like a huge statistical analysis. This is average in Excel. But like, um, if you take those out, you could see that we still have a pretty high, we have a spike in um, July um, and another smaller one in the fall as well. So based on this data and our risk assessments in the previous slide, what we're getting a feel of is that we're getting some intense blooms in the summer months, but we're getting more, less intense blooms in the fall. Um, so this date, uh, yeah, so that's what I just said there. Um, so, and this is just a graph of all the total observations that we made of the different taxa of cyanobacteria, and we see that Dilichospermum is by and large the most prominent cyanobacteria species here in Worcester, followed by Aphanomenazon. And this finding was confirmed by our community scientists with their pictures. These are all pictures taken by our volunteers of Dilichospermum. Um, we were very good at picking it out in our microscope slides. Um, another thing that's not graphed here, but as we saw, is definitely a concern, are picocyanobacteria. In conclusion, 2022 was the most successful year the WCMC has had to date. We have had twice as many sampling days. We had more volunteers and partnerships than ever before. We have the richest data set ever. I couldn't even analyze it all for you tonight. <laughs> but there's still a lot that we don't know. For example, um, so not for example yet. Our goal in 2023 is to continue to get better. We want to continue to refine this model of risk so that it is less conservative. Because right now it's a very conservative model. Um, we are erring on the side of there might be a bloom and there might be toxin production right now. But we don't even know what toxins are necessarily being produced just yet. And the reason for that is that these different cyanobacteria species, they create different toxins. Here we have Dilichospermum creates hepatotoxins and neurotoxins, but microcystis just produces an extra large dose of microcystin. So what do we make of all that when we see multiple cyanobacteria in a sample um, at different concentrations? We're not studying that. We're not in a place where we can study that. Thankfully, there are people who are studying that. Um, at UNH, our partner there, um, Nancy Leland, she's a professor that is studying the different types of toxins that are being produced by blooms that are dominated by different um, cyanobacteria species. She's creating a toxin estimator based on the regressions that she's found over time. So she has a website that she's launching where you could put in your pigment level and the species that's dominant in your sample, and it will spit back at you an estimate of how much toxin is in the water. So it's pretty cool. 
Um, she's hoping to have this up and running by next spring, which means that we will be able to start implementing it in the future. But because we have all this great data, we'll be able to implement it in the past. So we'll be able to see how toxin concentrations have um, occurred in the past year versus going forward. So yeah, if you ever meet Nancy, you will learn something new well, probably three times over every time you talk to her. She is amazing when it comes to cyanobacteria. Um, up to this point, we've really been focused as the WCMC on measuring cyanobacteria, but a lot of people want to do something about it. And so this year, for the first time, we are going to be implementing a remediation project in 2023. Um, we are going to be implementing, um, again, we're looking at low cost methods that are easy to implement by volunteers. Um, there was, we're going to be using barley straw. There is a theory out there, a hypothesis, that the decomposition products of barley straw, when it's immersed in water, so when it's breaking down and decomposing, when it's wet, that there's um, the compound hydrogen peroxide is produced and that this low level dose of hydrogen peroxide naturally occurring or produced by this decomposition is harmful to cyanobacteria but not to other organisms. And so this theory was tested in a project that we collaborate, the city of Worcester collaborated on um, this past um, summer at, in Northampton. Um, some volunteers there selected some ponds that had been blooming throughout the, over the years. They stuffed some bags full of empty water bottles to float them and put some uh, barley straw in them, tied them to some stakes, and measured the, the cyanobacteria um, using our methodologies with the WCMC, and they found that there was uh, nothing. <laughs> they had very low levels of cyanobacteria. Of course, we didn't have data to compare it to in the past, but their visual inspections of the lake were that things had done had gone much better using the barley straw. We do have some pretty consistent data on cyanobacteria, and we have a pond that is very productive consistently. And so come spring, um, we're going to be asking for volunteers from the WCMC to come out to Northampton and help us pack some barley straw and we are going to be installing a project in Burn Coat Pond as part of our um, sampling and, and continue sampling it the way that we have over the last two years. So, uh, and, see, and see if there's any difference and then see if this is something that maybe folks can use at other ponds around Worcester. So this is a pretty exciting project. Uh, we are hoping to continue to do outreach to schools um, Currently, we have a group of WPI students during their IQP, which is an interqualifying project. They're all required to do them um, while they're um, at WPI. And they're working with the city of Worcester right now to, um, on a project called Increasing Environmental Literacy in Worcester through STEM learning modules. And what they're doing is they're using the methodologies that we have in the WCMC um, as a STEM learning device. They're creating modules for teachers and uh, scout leaders that fit into the curricula or the badges that they get um, that they need to attain throughout their service or throughout their um, education. Um, and the idea is that these modules will be available on our website and on um, some STEM learning websites and that we will have cyanobacteria monitoring kits that will be available on loan for um, teachers or scout leaders to borrow so that they can implement um, these, uh, these learning modules. And so I think this weekend they're going to be at Green Hill Park Pond um, with some scouts to um, try out the, the, uh, the module. And of course, the goal is to increase scientific literacy. If we could get a few volunteers while we're at it, that would be a great bonus as well. So this, uh, the growth that we've seen with the Worcester Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative has been 
explosive in the last two years. And a lot of that can be based on the help that we've received, not just from your volunteers, but from some interns that we've had along the way. A lot of you remember Evelyn. Um, she was an intern sponsored by WPI with us last summer who really helped us get the fluorometry readings going and making some really nice flashy reports for us. This uh, year we had um, a volunteer from Department of Sustainability and Resilience come and help us run those phycocyanin samples, um, Sushil. And then we had um, Alyssa and Emily from Worcester uh, State help us with some of the fluorometry samples um, at the end of the season. So like really, we need help. Volunteers um, and, and interns are like part of what we need to make the WCMC happen. Um, we are really excited that we received funding this past year to hire a part-time intern that will be working primarily with the WCMC. And um, I, I don't know if we want... <laughs> She's here tonight. <laughs> we have Emily, who has been working with the WCMC all year, and um, she's going to be joining us in the spring to, uh, to work on um, continuing the successes that um, we've had up to this point. Um, so we're really excited to have her as part of the team. So thank you for another great year. Um, in particular, I need to say thank you to the City of Worcester Department of Public Works and Parks, um, EPA, who has helped us develop these methods, and Nancy Leland from UNH, who has been our sounding board through all of this. But at the end of the day, like, it's you guys. Thank you so much, volunteers, for keeping, for keeping, uh, for continuing to come, bringing your samples, bringing your energy and your excitement to this project. We we really could not be here without you, and I am um, so thankful and also a little bit disappointed because we had created this patch to put on some beanies for you all tonight um, for the WCMC. They're not ready yet, but in the next week, we're going to have an email go out, and you could come by the office and pick up your embroidered beanie for the WCMC as our way of saying thank you for being part of this program. Um, we really couldn't do it without you. So um, with that, if there are any final questions before we go, Dan. Oh, there aren't that many. Um, this year, there were a couple that we had last year that we just didn't have volunteers for this year. Um, I believe Crystal Pond in University Park, or is it University Pond in Crystal Park? It's the one across from Clark. Um, that one was in the program um, for quite a few years, um, but we didn't have a volunteer this year. Curtis Pond, we had a volunteer last year, but not this year. And I believe there was one more, but it's, it's pretty much all of them, which is amazing. Yeah, um, so I don't know. And, unless people want to like drive from Boston, like I don't know what we're gonna <laughs> do. There's, um, it, it's really amazing that we've been able to to get to all of them. Any other questions? So there is another community science cyanobacteria program on the Cape. Um, they use, um, they're called the APCC. Um, it's an offshoot of a larger nonprofit called the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. Um, and they have a series of volunteers that collect in the different municipalities up the Cape. Um, they work very closely with um, Nancy Leland, the woman that I referenced a few times tonight. And so they have a very particular um, methodology that they use with some very um, um, diehard volunteers that go back over and over and they're going out in the middle of the week and it's, it's a much more um, regimented program. Um, but that is like the closest thing and, and we already do work very closely with them as far as sharing methodologies and um, working with Nancy to, to revi refine the model. Yep. Are there, are there that you're not like Crystal Pond, which is very close to Clark University. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Alyssa? Um, would it, you know how there are some sites that I particularly like on the one I can think of top of my head? Would it make sense to go another, another sample date in early November next year? Like just to kind of get the tail end of that? Or? 
That's a great question. Given that we're seeing, I, it, it is, it's a crazy thing, but there was a time mid-October when Coes was blooming and we saw this increased activity at Lake Quinsigamon and Flint Pond that we thought, wow, maybe we should continue to be sampling. And so that might be a possibility in the future for select ponds and those volunteers that are interested in continuing. Um, so that's a great idea. Oh. oh, yeah. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, so Lake Quinsigamon has had some challenges this summer, um, all originating in the same area. Um, so there was an unfortunate accident that happened in the uh, beginning of February in which um, the Lake Ave sewer pumping station um, released a large amount of raw sewage into the lake. Um, and so there was a lot of concern about what that was going to do to the lake. It was very hard to measure um, those impacts because they were confounded by the fact that there was a large construction site up on um, um, off Belmont Street that um, consistently was discharging large amounts of sediments through the stormwater system to the very same area in the lake. What I can say is that area is having some challenges right now, and so we're going to be giving it a lot of special attention. We actually have a cyanobacteria monitoring device located in that general area where both of those events happen, just to see if we could um, track it a little bit better. But yes, that's the kind of stuff that you would expect to affect cyanobacteria, because all those sediments, they all contain the nutrients that all of the um, cyanobacteria really love to eat. Other questions? Um, yep. We've already seen Worcester School kids participating in it. This past year, we had some folks from um, Bancroft School um, go out once or twice with um, their teacher. Um, and then we also had an after school program, so that through the Ecotarium that also did that. The challenge um, with, and, and I, I agree, that would be awesome to have them do that. And, it would be a long-term goal and we want to continue to get more students in there. Currently the challenge is the sampling season usually starts in May and goes through October. And so that consistency um, is a challenge, not necessarily um, mean that we can't do it. But um, we certainly want to get um, students exposed to these methods and learning about these um, ecosystem relationships. Other questions? Brian? So we have large numbers of ducks and geese in the list of ponds, meaning we have high fecal counts. Is that contributing to saying that they're going to go? So, um, Goose droppings, in addition to containing bacteria, also contain a lot of phosphorus. And so it is possible that um, if you have a large amount of um, droppings on a beach or something and then there's a rain event, it could bring um, those drop the the phosphorus from those droppings into the water. We had this really interesting, I think it's actually here, is it on Bell Pond? Bell Pond, there was a particularly geesey, rainy day that Bell Pond, you remember, is the one that like never blooms. We had this very quick bloom that happened right here on the warm water on the shore right after a rain event just most likely from the goose droppings. It went away in a day and we haven't had it again, but it was like a very unique situation that we're attributing to that. So, yes. <laughs> Other questions? I've heard from, um, before I get from Cambridge and they were talking about things there, they, they're, they're problems. Yeah, and it, it absolutely, and and we saw that some um, ponds, the, the ponds reacted differently to the drought. Um, even though a lot of the lakes in Worcester are a lot of, you, you would expect them to be um, driven by two things, stormwater inputs and temperature. So it was a really hot summer. In addition to being the driest summer, it was one of the hottest summers we've had in a long time. Um, and so we saw that play out in different ways. At Indian Lake, the lack of stormwater coming in 
meant that we just didn't have the nutrient concentrations that we usually see coming in through Arrowrap Brook. Um, so we just didn't need to do the treatments that we usually do there. At um, Coe's Reservoir, we had two blooms. We never have blooms there. Um, we're digging into the data that we've collected there on um, nutrients and, and other factors. Um, and so we're, we're hoping to have a better answer for that. But it, it was really interesting how these two lakes that we do watch really closely reacted so differently to the dry, hot conditions. Um, and, and we saw that play out in other lakes as well. Um, again, it would be great to like have a chance to dig a little bit even deeper. And so if you have students or know students who are interested in playing with that data, that would be great. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for coming out tonight, so much for your participation. Um, I will be contacting you shortly about your beanies. If you are a guest here tonight and you're interested in learning more, getting on our mailing list, please um, leave your name at the uh, on the um, the sign-in sheet, and I'll be sending out an email with more information following the event. Um, take some sandwiches to go. Um, Oh, and I was requested by the planning division. We have a, ma a Worcester master plan for the Worcester residents. They're asking for input from all interested parties, you as environmental advocates. Um, they want to hear what you think about the direction that Worcester is going. So if you want to fill out that survey, there's a QR code there as well. So thank you again, and um, have a great night. Thank you.